Beginning in the 1990s, literary studies has started to see and is still seeing a discussion of post-postmodern literature as a new form of textuality whose exact shape is still unclear. So here's one definition Robert McLaughlin provided in 2012. The challenge of the post-postmodern author is to write within the context of self-aware language, irony and cynicism, acknowledge them, even use them, but then to write through them, to write through the cycle of self-reference, to represent the world constructively, to connect with others. McLaughlin's take reflects a fairly standard understanding of post-postmodernism as a literary trend, style or mode, following the perceived exhaustion of the postmodern playfulness, its self-awareness, or as Linda Hutchin called it in an often ill-appropriated statement, its self-absorbed narcissism. McLaughlin's statement, however, also contains one important limitation. In imagining a literature after postmodernism to answer to a historical and artistic challenge to come from a particular and particularly serious and reputable source, the postmodern author, it understands it as ultimately a high culture project, as something that will come to us from the serious novel of serious writers, serious men one might even imagine. Indeed, to many this view seems to be the common sense. After the exhaustion of the radical formal innovations of postmodernism, new textual forms will only come from a renewed artistic and stylistic effort. In consequence, we usually think of post-postmodern writing as serious writing, preferably of the novelistic kind. My presentation will complement this perspective by reading two decidedly popular mass market books, one novel and one nonfiction follow-up. Together, both partake in a post-postmodern search for forms of writing that at once acknowledge the power of language and narrative to construct realities, and that, on the other hand, reconnect language to the social sphere. The two texts I will speak about are written by Larry Beinhardt, a US author primarily known for his novel American Hero, that was heavily rewritten into the feature film Wag the Dog. In 2004, Beinhardt published The Librarian, a novel about a large-scale conspiracy to steal the US presidential election. In the book, a college librarian gets implicated in this conspiracy by chance, and not least because he simply tries to stay alive, increasingly uncovers it just in time for the election. This plot serves as a vehicle to talk about a more fundamental epistemic dilemma. The novel introduces the notion of fog facts, facts that are known, but that, because they have not been properly textualized, fail to have the impact facts are supposed to have. They are known and not known at the same time. The fictional universe of the novel is closely mapped on the historical and political landscape of the USA of 2004, and this mapping, more importantly, suggests that the novel's central concern, the power of fog facts, and the difficulty of recuperating them, of turning them into real facts, was also a central political problem of the US's political and social condition in 2004. This is also where, according to the novel's basic tenet, the librarian comes in as a protagonist. Schooled in the Gutenberg Galaxy skill set of reading and researching, he's the only one able to penetrate the fog of facts and to find out the truth. Immediately after publishing the novel, Beinhardt followed up writing a nonfiction book on the same subject matter, Fog Facts, Searching for Truth in the Land of Spin. This book explores the same epistemic textual dilemma, this time from a nonfiction perspective on the real W. Bush administration. Using the two books, Shared Subject Matter, the question of the relationship between facts, text, and reality, I will read them together as one shared textual project that searches for the proper way of putting the subject matter into its proper form. To do so, I will proceed in three larger steps. I will first explore weaknesses in both books, arguing that these weaknesses mark the extent to which neither quite succeeds within the limitations of its respective form, making both a necessary supplement to each other. I will secondly look at what the books do achieve, arguing that their moments of success are located exactly where they attempt to find alternative forms of realism. In a final step, I will then read, I will 
read them as attempts at a new textuality that quite literally happens after postmodernism. Together, all three parts hopefully make somewhat plausible my initial claim that the post-postmodern search for new forms of realism does not only take place in serious art, but also in more mass market oriented venues. So here we go, criticism. Arguably both the librarian and Fox Facts are in themselves incomplete projects. Reviewing the novel for the New York Times, Karen James remarks that Beinhardt, and I quote, is better at imagining outrageous plots that slyly allude to current politics than he is at describing characters or situations. The criticism I find is right on cue. As a novel, The Librarian is not a particularly deep or well-developed piece. It has, fast -paced, it has a fast-paced plot. It is indeed a veritable page turner, but the characters remain flat, the metaphors often lack sophistication, and the situations, as James calls it, are indeed often not very well-developed. More importantly, it may well be the, the weakness of the character of the librarian, the book's failure to come up with a deep, round person that damages its overall project. The book wants, the book wants to argue that only a librarian can confront the fog of facts. But in the course of the novel, its lead character suddenly turns into a James Bond-like spy, and his ability to unravel the mystery ultimately has more to do with his skills at fighting than with his more bibliophilic powers. In the end, the genre of spy fiction kidnaps the book, whose actual project of introducing the fog of facts gets lost in face of the drive of the narrative. If the novel's genre conventions thus keep its non-fictional project from unfolding, Fog Facts Curiously, the non-fiction book, Fog Facts Curiously also has shortcomings that work the other way around. Here, the conventions of nonfiction fail to contain the story Beinhardt wants to tell. Early on in the book, right after introducing the notion of Fock facts, Beinhardt does quotes, of all things, from his own novel to prove his point. Reminiscing about how he first came across Fock facts, he writes that they were all public facts. They were in print, they had been referred to, reviewed, and cross-referenced elsewhere, yet they seemed to be invisible. I was working on a novel about an election like the one coming up in 2004. It seemed to me that the struggle to pull some of these facts out of the fog would be central to the real campaign. Therefore, they had to be central to the campaign in the book where it was described this way. And then he quotes from his own novel, fog facts, that is, it was not a secret, it was known, but it was not known. But it is not only the fog facts that Beinhardt pulls from fiction. Trying to explain what real facts are in opposition to this, he refers to the TV series Dragnet, a series whose moral fantasy about the solidity of facts he ironically notices, but never reflects as problematic in itself. Beinhardt explains, just the facts, Ma'am Sergeant Joe Friday used to say on Dragnet, the weekly TV show, each episode told us was, they told us was taken from the actual files of the Los Angeles Police Department. A crime had been committed, the police came, they investigated, they found the facts, those elemental, hard, and singular truths. The failure of the 9-11 is, report is basic. It fails to do what Sergeant Joe Friday would have done, get the facts, ma'am, just the facts. This reliance on fiction to explain, of all things, what facts really are is complemented by a number of factual errors that other reviewers have pointed out as hurting the book's overall credibility, as making it fail by the standards of nonfiction. Indeed, it is other nonfiction books that lead reviewers to conclude that, at bottom, I agree with much of what Beinhardt says, yet stronger works exist. Joe Connison's Big Lies, Craig Unger's House of Bush, House of Sod, and the more contemporaneous The Truth with Jokes by Al Franken come to mind. In the final analysis, readers are better served by such books than this one. I've said before that both books partake in the same textual project, and while I will explore the shared project in more depth in a few seconds or minutes, both books on their surface seem to be engaged in a didactic project. They both want to educate their readers about the concept of Fock facts and about the Fock facts impact on the US political system. This becomes particularly clear in a surprising moment of direct reader address in The Librarian, the novel. Towards the end of the book, the narrator suddenly turns to the reader 
claiming that it depended on the readers of the book whether or not the fictional electoral fraud in the novel can be stopped. It depends on you, he says. Sorry about that, but it does. I find this direct address remarkable because to me it signifies not only another attempt to bridge the gap between fiction and reality, between the fictional world of the novel and the actual reality of the reader, but because it seems to acknowledge that there is only so much the book can do by itself. Leaving the outcome of the election up in the air, it quite literally remains incomplete, asking for the readers to contribute their share to a happy end. What's more, this very dynamic returns at the end of Fox Fic Facts, the nonfiction book, a similarly incomplete attempt at expressing the matter, with Beinhardt again addressing the reader, the subject of this book is ongoing. As I write it, things are changing, and I want to add and subtract. Fortunately, we are in the age of the internet, and books need not end when they end. To continue this dialogue, go to fogfacts.com. So much for what I feel are failures in the books, or moments of incompleteness. Now to some praise. Of course, there are more favorable reviews, or even in reviews I already quoted, there are some more favorable sections. Indeed, the quote above is taken from one such favorable review of The Librarian, and it underscores that there is another way of looking at Beinhardt's work. In fact, by measuring the novel against the nonfiction Bush bashes, this review does not only draw attention to the fact that even nonfiction books are not simply nonfiction. More importantly, it points towards a particular reading practice that holds for both volumes I discuss a reading practice that looks for pleasure exactly in how a book engages the real political situation in a partisan way. Indeed, more favorable reviews, at least of the librarian, tend to focus precisely on the novel's ability to speak of reality in particularly privileged form. In the review mentioned above, Karen James thus contextualizes the librarian in a number of non-realistic political fictions and asserts that these books, like many other current political fictions, take a skewed approach to realities too fraught to face head on. In addition to comedies in which death and global tragedies occur, there are fantasies that lead to a kind of superrealism. James's comments, of course, are not the only indicator of the more complex dynamics surrounding the novel's referential gestures. In a published letter to the author, one reader accordingly explains, Dear Larry, I just finished reading The Librarian, and interestingly enough, I was in Barcelona on the night of our first presidential debate, which was only available on European TV at 3 a.m., so I missed it, while reading of the debate between Scott and Murphy, the fictional two candidates in the book. I hope the debate later this week will have an equally powerful zap. We need it. There's the zap. What makes this letter interesting is the complexity by which this reader goes back and forth between the fictional debate in the book and the real one. The way in which she relates the personal experience of being in Barcelona to the real televised debate she missed and to the fictional one she replaced it with, hoping that the transmission between reality and fiction also works the other way around, that the next real debate could have the same game-changing moment as the fictional one. In this sense, there is evidence that the simple referential gestures I've read as didactic above are more than just that. If realism can be identified as a mode of writing that is meant to give readers the effect it, repre it represents life and the social world as it seems to the common reader, the referential gestures, including the direct reader address, make for powerful reality effects indeed. They give readers a chance to actualize the narrative with regard to their own perceived reality. If Karen James is right that these political fictions provide a new and much needed kind of super realism, this has to do with their reality effects, with the textual interfaces they open up to their readers' reality, inviting them to actualize the narrative and to find immersion by aligning the fictional and the everyday universe they live in. But even if one thus acknowledges that Beinhardt's two books attempt a particular form of realism, does this make them post-postmodern writing? One way of looking at this question is by bluntly translating post with after and then looking at the author's bibliography or biography. 
Indeed, The Librarian is the first book Beinhardt wrote after American Hero, the novel that was turned into Wag the Dog. And indeed, American Hero is a markedly different book, and one that pushes a lot of buttons usually associated with postmodern writing. Written in 1994, it too tells the story of electoral fraud, and it too maps its own narrative closely on historical realities, this time claiming that the Gulf War of 1991 did not take place, but that it was staged in Hollywood on behalf of George Herbert Walker Bush, father of W. However, textually, this earlier novel indeed follows a very different trajectory from The Librarian. Reminiscent in style of the novels of, of Elmer Leonard or Carl Hiasen, it uses its Hollywood setting to ignite a firework of narrative special effects. It sets up two different narrative levels, each with their own font, only to, to confuse these layers later on. It misleads the reader about a love story central to the text, only to later revise the story. And it comes up with a sudden frame narrative in the end that radically changes much of the earlier narrative. Adding to this, it features a huge number of footnotes, some commenting on the relationship between the fictional universe and reality, some staying strictly within the fictional universe, and some commenting on the writing process of the book. And it features several disclaimers, all insisting on the fictional nature of the book, and thus paradoxically questioning exactly that. In other words, if postmodernism is about playing textual games, American Hero, the earlier novel, clearly is a piece of postmodern writing, and a quite exciting one indeed. Like Gossip, the book insinuates large-scale political fraud only to keep insisting that it was just asking questions, thus claiming for itself the privilege of being just inconsequentially playful. Hardly any of this playfulness is present in The Librarian, much less so in Fog Facts, suggesting that the subject matter or the historical circumstances of the latter asked for a different, more serious kind of text. The strongest argument for the librarian and Fock facts being attempts at postmodern writing then might be the incompleteness of both books taken for themselves. Explaining the nature of his text, Beinart explains in Fock facts that this book was not a finished achievement but a journey. Whoops. Sorry. I live in the country, sometimes the fog is so thick that you don't even know where you are. If you're driving, the beams from your headlights just bounce back at you. Then as you go around a corner or the elevation changes up or down, you emerge from the fog and suddenly everything is clear and you say to yourself, aha, uh -huh, that's where we are. This book is a journey somewhat like that. It's not a catalog of fog facts, nor is it a thesis. Rather, this is a journey in search of those moments where we come around the corner, go up, down, low, or rise up high, and see some particular thing or some series of events that allows us to say, oh, that's where we are. Beinart's comments are, first and foremost, about the subject matter of his book, of his two books, to be precise, The Fog Facts, about the difficulty of retaining a sense of reality in a society dominated by Fog Facts. However, in their ability to actually say what kind of a text they introduce, in their inability to find a clearer picture in the foggy reference to a fog in which one gets lost and drives around, Beinart's remarks also point to the extent to which this is a textual problem. To conclude, the genre of, the genre of political fiction constitutes an established arena of popular writing in which the fictional and the real mix. Accordingly, it comes as no surprise that political fiction should also constitute a privileged place for the search of new forms of textuality, recognizing the power of language and narrative to construct realities while simultaneously insisting on their ability to comment on people's actual lives. Reading this hybrid desire for a fusion of metafictional awareness with social relevance as post-postmodern and tracing it in popular texts complicates more standard notions of post-postmodernism as a movement restricted to serious writing and important novels by important post-postmodern authors. More poignantly, it complicates a view on post-postmodernism as simply a formal response to a formal exhaustion of postmodernism and ties it to larger cultural shifts in American society. Thank you. <laughs>